Hi, this is Stu and welcome to Pebbles Valley's interview slots and here I'm with Jeff and Harmony Lichty and um, welcome guys and I want to say, you know, you're getting a really good response from the students here. They're loving your sort of relaxed approach but forceful sometimes but seem to know what they need and not pushing them in directions they don't want to go or don't need to go. And is that a sort of generally your approach? You seem to be very wise as to what each student requires. What do you think? Are you, is that something you try and foster? Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, I think with the, with years of teaching Mysore, yeah. you get sort of a sense of where people are at on any given day and you're, you know, you get the sense that somebody wants to deepen something a little bit more, you can kind of facilitate that for them. Or if you get the sense someone's a little tired or um, wanting to hold back a little bit, you can just give just them that it. space, hold the space for them to, to maybe explore on their own without too much extra input. And you guys, you mentioned a couple of things in the in the welcome sort of get together that we have here before each retreat starts. And one of them was was to do with length of practice. And I, I always perk my ears up when I hear that because I have an atrociously long practice. Mm -hmm. And and so you guys were saying, okay, look, if it's over two hours, you know, maybe we need to talk about why it's over two hours. Or so, what were the what's the thought processes that go behind that? Well, I guess I should comment because it was my comment. It was your comment. It was my yeah. comment. Um, f firstly, I think people that are over two hours yeah. need to think about and be very clear why they're practicing and what they're practicing for. Um, not that the length of time is the issue because it's really not, but rather are we being efficient in our practice and are we being efficient in our life or is the mat just another way to defer our responsibilities from elsewhere so to me it's it's a much more global question rather than like this asana that asana right what, where does it take us but rather how do we manage our practice efficiently so that we're working it to the best of our abilities and then also adding the value off the mat yeah. so when someone says i've got a much longer than two hour practice i'm like what are you doing yeah. And so that becomes my question. And so I, it, it's like, well, what's going on? I mean, what, what are you doing? And, yeah. and um, so I would ask you, like, you know, like, why do <laughs> you practice really so well? Long, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, and, and I'm sp I was specifically speaking about asana. Yeah. Um, because really, when Sharat would lead a, a lead class, yeah. uh, a lead primary series, let's just take it there, you know, an hour and a quarter, an hour and 20 minutes is about yeah. the right length. Uh, right amount of time. So if you have people working from first series into second series and adding a bunch of second series postures on and they're going up and they're doing another 40 minute of second series. Yeah. Um, at what point are they not progressing efficiently through their, through their practice, yeah. you know, jump through fidget, fidget, you know, the, right. do my hair, put my ponytail <laughs> back, wipe my sweat, you know, this kind of thing and and again then it just becomes a matter of efficiency so yeah. that's why you know i i kind of made that as an off-the-cuff remark but, yeah but but that would be what i would i would want to look at yeah i like the idea you're saying there as well is to to look at the impact of that time you've allotted on the outside rest of your life as well you know why do you feel that you can allot three hours or more plus out of your day just for this or whatever. Yeah, I mean, my question is, are you yeah. hiding? What are you hiding from? Yeah. Like, are, you're hiding on your mat. You know, yeah. are you hiding on your mat from your relationship? Are you hiding from your work responsibilities? Are you hiding from, what are you hiding from? Yeah. Are you hiding? It's, it's just a question. It may not yeah. be, it may not be applicable at all. There are definitely times um, in my store where I, I'm not there yet, but there, there's been friends who have been, you know, doing all of second and yeah. almost all of third. And that, that is close to a three hour practice. Yeah. So, so there are some exceptional circumstances where that would, where it would go that way. But, um, mostly that's my, my thought process. Yeah. And how many you, have you always practiced relatively within those confines or you have, you know, how have you got, cause now you're finishing all of, all of third. Yeah. So did that require some really diligent work or has it just been an ongoing sort of rolling to 
rolling forwards? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there's been times where my practice has been quite long and extensive. But, and third series was about a 10 year process of yeah. me working through it step by step. So it wasn't a you did have a kid process, in there. and I did have a child <laughs> yeah. in the and middle. And you did have your appendix out in India. Yeah, and that I was had traumatic. I had surgery I as well, yeah. so it was a little bit, you know, two steps forward, three steps back, two mm -hmm. steps forward, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it was never. Uh, I don't think that it was a big push, but yeah. it, uh, you know, it, there was times where it was very difficult. <laughs> and if you guys have a, do you have a similar approach to the way you meet obstacles within the practice or the way you sort of deal with things let me ask you this both to answer individually so say for instance we all have you know a certain predisposition predisposition not easy to say towards some things it might be strength it might be a flexible spine it might be open hips or whatever so then we're faced with these things that we find relatively easy and then those things, normally there's an inverse side that we have other things that we find particularly difficult. So how have you approached those? If we start with maybe the easy stuff, have you approached those in, so we'll ask you both individually, because you've both got different body types, haven't you? Mm -hmm. As to how you've approached those sorts of things you found easy, shall we say. Looks like harmony first. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think when I first started the practice, there was a lot more things that I found easy. Okay, well that makes sense, now you're into third, yeah. Yeah, but even like the stuff that I used to find easy, I kind of find hard now. <laughs> okay, so do you think that's because you've got stronger doing the third, or I think, yeah, changed? I think that uh, extra strength through the, I used to be a lot more flexible, or okay. feel a lot more flexible, so yeah. some of the deeper back bending felt a lot easier. Okay. And I think with uh, a lot of the arm balances, it really um, strengthens your, your yeah. back and your shoulders, and so now I feel like the back bending's quite a bit more difficult than okay. it used to be. <laughs> um, but I think as far as easy stuff goes, I don't know, I just count my blessings and say, Thanks, thanks be to God that this <laughs> one isn't easy. as hard as all the <laughs> other ones. And Jeff, what about you? Do you, you know, is there a particular group of things that you've always found quite easy? I, I'm a bit similar in that at the beginning I found all of it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I think now I'm just finding it all a little bit more difficult. Uh, and, and, and I think some of it, to be honest, really is, yeah. is um, teaching more. Okay, so less time for yourself? Yeah, you know, at the beginning, you know, the first, you know, five years, I mean, we really spent a lot of time just in serious study without many responsibilities. And then, you know, life comes along and you have to take on more responsibility. And in taking on more responsibility, just there's a, there's a little more heaviness, I think, maybe just in, I don't want to say heaviness. Um, there's more to manage. Yeah. And when you're managing more, then, then you have to juggle a little bit more. And I, I feel like in that regard, there has been, you know, especially adding a child, you yes. know, for instance, that's the biggest thing really. Since Jedi has been born, I would say that's the one that really has made the, the biggest impact on yeah. practice. And from starting practice doing Sri Namaskara A, you know, and I've got my one hour where I think he's going to be asleep and I yeah. start into Siri Namaskar A, one or two of those, and then he's like, la, 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 and comes running out and he jumps on you and then you're like, okay, that was my practice for the day. Yeah. And, you know, I lie down and he jumps on you in Shavasana and that's the end of it and, and you know, it goes to that. So, um, in, in that sense, uh, practice has become much more difficult because then when I do get on the mat, you know, the consistency of a longer, stronger yeah, yeah, yeah. practice is gone. So, you know, we'll go back, we'll go to my on Friday. And for me, the first month is probably going to be a little torturous trying to like extend myself into yeah. practice in a much deeper way again, in a much more consistent way. Uh, and so in that way, I find that it's become a little bit more difficult. Uh, other things have become easier in that I don't have the same kind of expectations I used to have on myself and okay. and I've allowed 
I've just allowed myself to be a little easier with not trying to be at peak performance yeah. shape. But, and do you, do you think that's come with age and insight or has it come through life situation and adapting to that? Or do you think you would have got there regardless? That's a very good question. They're, of course, they're all very good questions, of course. <laughs> I think part of it's age and insight. Yeah. And, and then also part of it is, is having uh, more, like Jeff was saying, more responsibilities in your life, more things to manage, you know, um, a child, growing family responsibilities. You realize that you can't um, maybe be as indulgent as taking so much pride and time and effort in this tiny part of your life that's asana yeah. and you have to take the yoga further than what's happening on the mat and make it applicable to what you're doing all day long in the rest of your life yeah. and hopefully we all get there through whatever circumstances arrive eventually I think you start to realize that this asana is supposed to be a tool to help us um, in the rest of our life and to facilitate our growth and development and maturity and stability of mind uh, so that we can manage more and more and more yeah. responsibility yeah. rather than trying to take less responsibility so that we can just have our own little private personal you <laughs> know practice yeah, right yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's a bit of both it's you know sometimes life forces you to yeah. grow yeah. when maybe it's easier you know or maybe it would have been safer in some ways not to to be expansive in life yeah. but you know you can't just stay in this little cocoon of an asana practice forever you have to you have to take that and then and grow with it yeah. and let that be what is creating stability for you or creating steadiness creating peace and then but then Keep that going. Keep that going. You know. And what about on the flip side, those things that maybe you've come across, it might be a particular asana or it might be a block of asanas or uh, the time constraints or whatever. Those times where something has been particularly difficult, it might even be something that's going on in your body outside of the practice. How do you, how do you encounter those? What, what is it do you do and do you work differently with the way you approach things or your, your expectations? Jeff, we go with you. Uh, definitely would work differently. I mean, harmony is much more, I will, willful to, yeah. to make her way through it. And, um, uh, and there's a steadiness of mind and practice for her that's, uh, I think, I don't know if I would say stronger, but uh, I would say that's probably true. More right? determined. Like, well, yeah, more determined that where you're, you're like, you're going to get on your mat and you're going to, you know, bend your body to this asana again, you know. And, um, you know, I think my approach is a little bit different. I mean, I'm, I'm older, yeah. but... Um, is there much of a difference between you guys? Uh, 11 years. 11, 11 years, years. yeah. Well, that makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah, I'm 47 and Harm's 36. So, um, I guess I just feel that when it comes to those harder things, yeah. I'm I'm a little more willing just to sit back and let it unfold a little yeah. more naturally and now. Uh, not before, I mean, probably not 10 years ago, but definitely now I feel like um, I'm not gonna break myself into an asana shape. You yeah. know, I'm not gonna break myself to YouTube quality. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, well, this and might go on YouTube. You don't want to do something now? Just real quick. I, I, could, I could break <laughs> something out, maybe like a, a headstand in the pool or something. I, yeah, 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 some yeah. crazy shape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe at the end. Maybe at the end we can do some outtakes. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and so, I mean, is there something that sticks out in your mind that, okay, you came across such and such? And then you approached it in a particular all the, way? All the backbending been... stuff for me okay. has been difficult, like right from the beginning. So, um, I've had to spend a lot of time just lying over stuff, trying to open my back right. and, and open my heart. And I feel like in some ways, 
Um, Harmony is just much more open physically and probably mentally. I mean, I spend a lot of time as a medic and I think um, one time when Guruji was still alive, we were chatting with Guruji and I was talking to him and he says, mm, oh, old body having you slowly, slowly taking. And I guess I took that to heart, you know, yeah. and, and I mean, at the time I wasn't old it's, it's, and I'm still not. I, but it's more that I think what he saw was probably a combination of 16 years of being a paramedic and yeah. having some of that, you know, some of the traumas that I was involved in, um, they kind of get ab absorbed. absorbed a little bit. Mm. They get wrapped mm -hmm. up into your system a little bit. Yeah. And I feel like now I'm into my 16th year of, Ashtanga, I feel like now I'm going to get back to a nice neutral spot yeah. and it's going to be a nice clean slate. So uh, I'm looking forward to like having, Between you know, my 16 years of yeah. a met, 16 years <laughs> as, as a paramedic being wiped out with 16 years of yeah. asana. And now maybe now I can clean. start to, you know, now we can start doing some work. So <laughs> that'll be good. I'm looking forward to it. That sounds cool. We, we, how many are you going to lead in with? How you approach things and whether you think you're willful? You're willful. Are, are you, willful? you willful? You're not really willful. You're persistent as hell yeah <laughs> no um am i willful maybe a little <laughs> in life and on the mat yes i'm I, I i don't know if it's willful but just uh determined maybe maybe a little stubborn so how does that represent itself on the mat how do you how well, do you i don't give things? up easily okay and i think when i come across things that are difficult i try not to ever doubt yeah myself or my capabilities and if it doesn't work out as it often doesn't work out then i just try again okay so it doesn't keep, you don't get knocked down you don't yeah i try not to let it disturb yeah. my my confidence or my inner yeah. sense of stability or peace um i'll just yeah i just kind of keep going at it yeah. persistently and there's a difference between willfulness and carelessness or disregard for your body or yeah. that sort of thing so I'm, I'm gathering of course that there you're making that delineation yes of course I mean I, I don't I don't think that I force things yeah. I mean I don't really I've never you know forced myself into something where you know I've broken myself yeah. or had some you know something go wrong that way but you know I just I like to push myself up against that that edge yeah. of where, um, you know, the possibility is. So. And I, I remember saying to you, you know, getting through third must have required a lot of work. I mean, they're really complex postures yeah. and very involved. And I said, do you, did you do a lot of work outside of the practice? And you said, no, not really. I just kept on doing the stuff. And is that yeah. being a thread through? Because a lot of us, me included, I'm afraid, think, OK, I'm going to have to do a lot of this in order to do that and I'll go off and do it outside of the practice. And so, but it's good to hear that by continually going through things, you yeah. made the progress you've made. So with the third series practice, I didn't, I mean, I didn't really do a lot outside of the practice because, well, it, first of all- You don't have all, a lot of time. Yeah, first of all, in the, I, I was, you know, kind of working my way through it. And then I had an appendicitis one year when we were in Mysore. So I had to get my appendix taken out. So then I had to give myself a break for four to six weeks. She went from third series to no series. No series to Rebuild like. again yeah. from primary series while we were in Mysore. And yeah. then I think I ended up sort of doing some intermediate, but right. not a lot of intermediate before we had to leave. So okay. then at home, I had to rebuild my practice again. And then um, two years later, no. Three, yeah, two years later, I got pregnant, and so then I was Another pregnant, rest. Yeah. <laughs> and had a baby. So then it was rebuilding the practice up again, <laughs> and then after that, it was just really like trying to carve out a space to consistently practice. Yeah. And I think out of everything, that was probably the the thing that was the most helpful. Yeah. I didn't really, I didn't have a lot of time to do extra stuff because I was super busy with a newborn baby and yeah. then a toddler and now a... And a yoga school. And a and yoga school. Yeah. I was, we were teaching full time and we had just opened our yoga school too. So 
that was super busy. We were like crazy busy yeah, yeah. <laughs> with on. everything going on outside of the practice. So just carving out like consistent time to to start to work on the practice and then do the practice and then getting back to my store um, to practice with Sharat, my teacher, and having him give me some input. And, you know, Sharat never really moves me very quickly in the practice. He's got, he's known me for a long time. He gives me just enough. Yeah. And it's pretty, it's consistent, but it's not fast. Yeah. He always gives me like a few weeks to kind of work on something. He, so are you a plotter? Yeah, I'm a plotter. I just <laughs> <laughs> slow and steady <laughs> wins the race. He's, you know, he doesn't push me into things. I tend not to push myself, but yeah. I get there. Yeah, yeah it, but determined. determined. Uh, you know, yeah. determined plotter. You, you know, honestly, I I would say that um, this might be the difference, though, with with the certified teachers that are coming out now. Yeah. I mean, you to be certified with Sharat is not easy. It wasn't easy with anyone like yeah. for Guruji either of course but um it, it's a hard practice and to be able to do third series consistently with yeah. Sharat in my store under his watch and be given these postures year after year after year and build on them and be able to perform them you know every time you're showing up in my store yeah. in order to keep building on it that is the stira bega that is steady strength and being able to keep the mind steady and keep the body steady even when it doesn't feel like being steady keep the mind steady even when the body might feel steady you know all of these things together that is the stira bega and i think that um y you know maybe that's the difference like maybe i'm just a little more whimsical i'm like okay <laughs> whimsical. I, like I think that, that <laughs> might not be it for me you know or something i i don't know but i but that definitely is a component when yeah. you know strong determination and steadiness is what's really going to going to bring people through yeah. and it's not all about you know i need to do this to do that i don't need to do all these extra postures i don't need to do all this extra training yeah you know to to do postures you know but rather just do consistently the practice under a good teacher a consistent teacher one who knows you see that's the difference yeah. and i think that's part of the problem we talked about a little you yeah had mentioned a little bit about yeah. this earlier so many people now have workshop teachers yeah. so they go to a workshop for the weekend and then they don't check in you know with anyone and they're on their own and so they're sort of making up a little bit as they yeah. go and they take the pearls that they get from the workshops and workshops are great but the bottom line is that it's consistent it's consistently practicing under a teacher that will really give you the biggest growth benefit. Yeah. And, and even here, I mean, you know, we see that, you know, everyone has, I mean, the, the teachers that are coming through here at Purple Valley are fantastic, the best teachers in the world, but all of us are going to have a different slant on things. Yeah. So the, the practice becomes difficult. If you were to only be here, I know some of some of yeah. the people. I mean, we've got a lot of people here. that really mm -hmm. they they don't have a teacher because of where they live or the geography mm -hmm. or whatever, and and so what are the things that you feel, you know, when you see people that have been practicing at home for extended periods of time, perhaps we've got some good pointers for them to look out for in your own practice, things that you've come across regularly, and also maybe some positive things about practicing on your own. Okay, we know it's nice to have a teacher because it provides, you know, some insight and but it also takes a hell of a lot of discipline to be practicing on your own somewhere and get up every day and do it regardless. You know, sometimes it's easier to practice in a group situation. So maybe for both of you, you know, some some uh, uh, tips that's for people to look out for if they are one of those that are practicing consistently on their own. Yeah, well, what do you think? I think practicing consistently on your own is a lot more harder, yeah. a lot more difficult than practicing in a group. Yeah. Um, because when you practice in a group, you have the energy of the group. It kind of uh, motivates you and sustains you. Even if you're feeling a little tired that day, you can get in the group and all of a sudden you have a lot a more bit energy. Of lift. Yeah. And when you have a regular teacher, it's nice. There's a little accountability there, right? You, yeah. Someone you're showing up for. Um, when you practice on your own at home, you have to show up for yourself, yeah. which is challenging. And do you, do you notice things about certain types of alignment or certain types of 
is there more faffing around with people that practice at home or more ponytail tying or what you know whatever it might be or sometimes there can be yeah. sometimes there can be a little bit more fidgetiness a little bit less disciplined mind but sometimes the practices of if people have a very dedicated home practice sometimes it can be a little bit more integrated uh -huh. mm -hmm. so i think if you're practicing on your own at home one of the the best things you can do for your practice is just try to really sink into the vinyasa that breath and the movement yeah. and try and take out all the little extra things just try and be as consistent to the vinyasa yeah. as you can because it gets you through you can feel the flow of the practice it's like if you stop then the mind pulls you away yeah. from your practice so if you can just like sink into the breath sink into the vinyasa be in the posture move with the breath and don't worry too much about like alignment or perfection just try and be in that place where your mind is really present in what you're doing um, I think then your practice can be very cohesive yeah. and um, and we see that sometimes with people who practice on their own in a, in a disciplined way it's like they're not conflicted about should I do it this way or should I do it that way yeah because they've only got the one way yeah just they just do it, do it the way they do it yeah so sometimes practicing with too many teachers is worse than just practicing on your own at as home. you say because everybody comes from a different yeah. slant and uh, you can get a little bit you're confused. Which it's one? Confused. Which one to go with? Yeah. And and all of them are very good, and and they might all lead to the same spot. Yeah. You know. However. In in that we have to choose. I mean, tet pratishe dartam ekatet pavyasaha. This is from the sutras. It's like you take one practice. You know, this is very clear. Yeah. Um. You know, I think, with the with the home practicing crew, it's really important to try to remove as many obstacles as you can. So, I mean, y you know, you only have to go on Facebook and you see, you know, someone doing a downward dog and their cat's coming through and then their yeah. dog's coming through and, you know, their kid's coming through and their whatever's coming through. And, yeah. and I mean, there's some things, of course, you're not going to be able to get, get rid of the responsibilities that you have. However, a couple things come to mind. I mean, try and practice in the same spot in your house every day. You know, keep it consistent. Yeah. You know, keep it clean. Set it up maybe the night before. You know, make sure that there's it that you're you're not running into simple conflicts of you know I gotta go past my fridge to get to my mat. I don't know right. whatever it happens to be. <laughs> Is you that know, a big calling but for start you? to see that yeah you know like my beer fridge no <laughs> no my chocolate fridge yeah. you know whatever uh, but you kind of understand what I mean. Yeah, of course. Create create a sacred space and I'm not saying that it, it some people it could just be I only have the the galley in my kitchen that's fine it yeah. could be the galley in your kitchen but try to get in the habit of immediately stepping on the mat and just starting yeah and start and that was one thing that Sharat was really great with us at the beginning you know there's a few times I remember thinking oh I got to open my hips so I'd go in I'd lay down I'd try and do a hip open or whatever he'd come storming out of the office like <laughs> just start you know just start and you know really it's such a great life lesson isn't it you know yeah. just start don't if you wait till all of the parameters are perfect we're never going to do it for anything for so yeah. many things i just, have about half an hour like, flapping around before i start yeah right like it's just just get on your mat and start and the first siri namaskar doesn't have to be spectacular yeah. you know but start yeah. and so to me try and create a spot that's sacred try and just get there with your feet on the mat and yeah. and then you're going to start growing the energy of practice in that area um the other thing yeah i mean those are the two main things i think probably that and what about motivation because for a lot of people now in europe um and canada of course in america's the winter is coming isn't it and it's dark and it's cold and even to go to practice if you got a i remember cycling to practice you know in england in the winter and it was dark outside and so, uh, you know but then you get there and then ah, oh, okay now we're into it and we're getting going so sort of things to help motivate them or ways of channeling your thought process to make sure you keep that consistency make sure you keep it going 
never hit the snooze button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's get cool. up. Like, yeah. just do it. Yeah. So that's it, really. You just got to go and just do it. Just don't hit the snooze button. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I'm, I'm like, this morning I hit the snooze button twice. I'm like, I know never to hit the snooze button. You know, <laughs> I, you I mean, I'm not saying it. you're going to do it every time. But, <laughs> but, you know, if you make it your habit to get up, and yeah. then what's going to happen is you're going to start waking up before that snooze button is going to go. You're going to wake up two or three minutes before your alarm even goes. You're yeah. like, cool. It's time. I got to get up. You look at your watch. You're like, right. Okay, go. Yeah. And then, and then you know, it, to me, it, it's this idea that you, it's almost beat your clock. Beat your clock. Make it your internal clock. Let your internal clock wake you up. But have your alarm ready, you know, and wake just up and get up yeah. and just get up and get moving. Yeah. And there's lots of excuses not to it's cold out you want to lie under the covers you want to snuggle up you know like whatever it is like there's always an excuse but just do it live which the, of live the two the of you is, is more determined like that are you pretty equal is there never any doubt do you practice at different times or yeah we don't really practice together ever anymore ever. not anymore because <laughs> because of the little one or, or yeah okay yeah. and the teaching responsibilities and okay and um and what about like if you're on holiday and, and so you weren't teaching, would you choose to practice together or is it a distraction to have the other one there? Well, Harmony does asana. Often I'll be doing pranayama while she's doing it. So sometimes, okay. um, I don't know, like when we've been here, you know, she'll be doing asana and, yeah. and I'll be doing my pranayama. And, Hitting the snooze button. Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> how's that going over there, honey? Oh, it's no. It's time already. How did I miss it's my like, practice? <laughs> Can I backbend you yet? Oh, no, no, snooze. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. We don't practice together very much. Ever, yeah. Sometimes we used to, but. Yeah, and, once and you in know, a while we really, like. you know, really, I, I, at one point in my store, I, well, both of us, I guess we came to it together, but I sort of realized it's like, wow, I got to like move away from Harmony. Because what I think happened in my store is that Sharat sort of teamed us up to the lowest common denominator, which was me. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it was better for Harmony to be seen on her own map by herself, not okay. beside me. And so uh, at some point it was just like, you know, you go practice, like go and kick it and I'm going to be doing my practice and yeah. you know because I, I don't care if I do any more asana really and and um, Harmony really wanted to get through third and and you know I, I'll look at it but I'm not you know busted either way and um, and so the difference with that <laughs> 35,000 feet of, <laughs> at 35,000 feet it's so difficult <laughs> um, <laughs> you know <laughs> no but I, I guess I guess you know somewhere in there we did we just sort of like we just split our mats up and yeah. it was more so Harmony can do her own thing and not be bothered with me and if I'm having a bad day in the mat and I can do my own thing and I can have a bad day in the mat or not have a bad day in yeah. the mat and you know we can talk about it later or not and you know and mostly we don't it's sort of like really it, yeah because it it doesn't really matter practice yeah. is practice so yeah. um but i think it did actually help harmony uh didn't it you know moving away from to me get so a that, distraction of some no not the distraction <laughs> i think no 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 i think i honestly i i really believe like i i really believe sharat sort of was holding you back so i could keep up and he it's didn't like want to make you feel bad maybe he didn't want to make me feel bad or something <laughs> i don't know you know side. Yeah. And, yeah yeah whatever you know but but it was so much better when she just could go yeah. on her own and like fly <laughs> through asana and i could you know you know muddle my way through in my tolerated kind of way so you know it's fine it, it's totally fine really I, I i'm quite good with it and you, you know? touched on one of the sutras yeah. just now and and yeah there's a lot of people out there that want to start getting into a bit of philosophy and i know how many is it right to say a double double philosophy major how do we it's, say it uh, it's just two, two bachelor's degrees like in a philosophy double degree. yeah. one in philosophy and run, one in religious studies. okay so you should know your stuff so, so, <laughs> so how do you, how do people make a start and, and how do they bring it something that is from such a long time ago, mm -hmm. how do they make it fresh and applicable to now? Well, I think one of the 
best ways is to get a good, easily understandable translation of the Yoga Sutra. Can you recommend one in particular? Yeah, so Swami Satchitananda okay. has a very good, easily readable version of the Yoga Sutra. Okay. That uh, is quite, it's nice. You can read the sutras, there's a word for word translation, and he gives a short interpretation. Yeah, that is written in a very understandable way okay. that makes it applicable to life. Um, another, when I first started practicing, um, a book that came into my world <laughs> was called um, Meditations from the, from Mat, the Mat by, by okay. Rolf, Rolf Gates, I think it is. Gates, I think. Might have his name yeah. wrong, but he's a vinyasa flow teacher from good. down the States. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ex military, ex alcoholic, but really beautiful book. I mean, such a nice. It was really nice. Yeah. He kind of uh, does a short sort of paragraph meditation, not meditation, but like some insight yeah. for every day of the year. So it's 365 little... Oh, okay. The one you can take yeah. each day. And yeah. it's based on the sutras. So he'll have sort of a section on ahimsa yeah. and, or nonviolence and then a section on satya, truth. And it goes all the way through to samadhi. Okay. So... That was really a very gentle introduction. Mm, that was nice. Yeah, and a, that was nice. And and like drip feeding over a year. It was yeah, really nice. Yeah, actually. and you I don't have to that. like um, take. You know, it's not. It's not so much that you're like, what is he talking about? It's it's yeah. really nice, easily relating relatable yeah. book. Yeah, um, great. Actually, I should do that again myself. I like. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was a go. nice one. The and sales then, are oh, going to oh, rock it nice. in that particular <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I think a nice Gita. The Bhagavad Gita, a nice Gita translation would be good. Again, a recommendation? I like, uh, I think Graham Schwig has a really nice translation. It's it's basically just simply the Gita, no big commentary. Um, there's just a few little footnotes maybe to help you understand certain yeah. words. Um, and it's in a more like a poetry kind of form. Yeah. Uh, so, like the Gita would read, because the Gita is a song, right? So, I mean, don't say right to me, because I'm like in an oblivion <laughs> of ignorance when it comes to philosophy. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, it's a song. That's, yeah, that's I might even get there yeah, one day. Gita, Gita, means, Gita means song. I mean, it's a story, but it, it can be chanted, right. you know, in a way that has a nice rhythm to it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a bit of poetry in a yeah. Sanskrit. That's cool. Yeah. And you've both, I mean, obviously, Jeff, as well, you've got a good handle on the Sanskrit. And, and have you delved together to certain things or just come from different angles? Or how did it work? Yeah, we've what? spent some time studying together. We've um, studied with Jaishri and Narasimhan in Mysore. So yeah. we spent quite a few years studying with them and chanting the sutras. Yeah. Um, and then we've studied with some other teachers also in, in Mysore. Uh, doing philosophy, um, Professor Nagaraja Rao, and um, mm -hmm. who else? A few other professors. Professors that know their <laughs> business. Philosophy, yeah. yeah. Um, and some Sanskrit teachers. So. And is there particular bits that really resonate with you more than other bits, shall we say, that, that you thought, oh, okay, yeah, I can really relate to this? Yeah, I like the stuff on the sutras and the Gita, personally. That's sort of my favorite. Um, we did a little bit of study on uh, Sankhya and... Um, what was the logic school? One of the logic schools, like... Mimamsa. Mimamsa, maybe, or something. Okay. And those were a little... Not so relatable for me. Yeah. Um, even though Sankhya is the the underpinning philosophy for both yoga and Ayurveda. Um, it's sort of once you kind of get what you need from that, I didn't feel like I needed to go, go deep. deeper into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's just me. I mean, everybody's journey is going to be different, yeah, of course, isn't totally. it? And they'll draw different things, yeah. things from it. Yeah. But so, Jeff, you've also got a background. So we've got the background of, of philosophy and the background of, obviously, as a paramedic, you learn a lot about the body and there must be a depth of anatomy in there. 
do you how much do you draw upon that when you're looking at students i mean i don't think that i use too much anatomical knowledge in my teaching right now i, I mean besides basic alignment things you yeah, know trying to safety keep, and, yeah like safety yeah. safety bits i it certainly wouldn't be like you i mean like i don't i don't have um you know, functional anatomy was not so much the big thing. And, no. and, you know, like, you know, making sure I could hit a chest tube into the pleural space or like right. decompress a chest or, you know, like find the cricothyroid yeah. thyroid membrane if I wanted to do a, you know, yeah. surgical airway. I mean, <laughs> those things didn't really, you know, translate well to like the Mysore <laughs> room at the moment. Was so, everybody a bit afraid uh, <laughs> to lay down in Shavasana <laughs> to start with? Just lie down, I got the scalpel out, you know. Um, you know, so some of some of my emergency medicine stuff just really doesn't translate, to no. be honest. Um, where it does, it does translate in in simple ways. Where you know, someone comes up lightheaded, I grab their pulse. I, you know, okay. immediately. Like, there's some yeah. simple things that I'll yeah. always do that that um, you know, I can tell a lot immediately from that. Um, anatomically, yes. I mean, of course, I know muscles and bones, and yeah. and you know, I I know where they are. But functional anatomy is is not. Yeah. so good anymore um i'm the thing that i draw on the most from my medic days i think is it's about pragmatics you know like i'm a pragmatist if the stuff's not working like we got to do something different right you know and it kind of goes like that because you know when i was a medic it's like it was pretty simple go there sick not sick that was the question are you sick are you not sick and yeah. let's get you to the hospital one way or the other fast or slow you know and a bit like that and we'd do something on the way and sometimes it'd be pretty cool um <laughs> but um when it comes to when it comes to our pursuit of yoga i feel like so often we can get caught in in a philosophical approach or we can get caught even in an anatomical approach mm, sure. where we spend so much time in our head that we just forget what we're doing and so that goes back to what we were talking about that that first night even here at the retreat yeah. which was like what is your goal with doing this if your goal is to get strong and flexible then great keep coming and and you know what we'll be able to help you with that straight away even just by doing simple asanas yeah. you know and taking you through primary series you're going to get strong and, and flexible and we'll try to do it in a way that keeps you safe so that you can continue to practice. Yeah. Um, if it's that you want to build more focus and determination, great, because this will be the starting spot to take you deeper into the practices, you know, and we'll take, we'll know to take you a little maybe closer to your edge yeah. if that's where you want to go and lean into some of the fears that you have. But I, I feel like um, there's a middle path where we need to really be aware of our anatomy and be aware of the philosophy and be aware of kind of where we're going but then we need to just get on the mat and practice and accept what is this i i joke with um I, i've made jokes this week but you know with our students in victoria yeah. um y you know about the most important bonda being the fourth bonda you know and um and they're like the fourth bonda what's the fourth bonda like well, there's like mula banda udiana banda people are doing jalandara banda. yeah i'm like well you're not going to read about it because i made it up and uh you know it's to smile right it's like lift the corner edges of your lips during your yeah, practice yeah. and seriously i think you know we can get so caught up in an anatomical approach or a, or a philosophical or approach or one teacher's approach or that somewhere in there we've become so serious that we've Stop lost enjoying it. We've lost the enjoyment of the practice, the whole reason that we came in the first place. And really what we need to do is learn to come back to that spot of enjoyment, moment to moment awareness where really there's nothing wrong right now in this moment. It's when I allow myself to go to the future and the weight of the future comes barreling in on me or where I get stuck in the past and I'm like, oh, I made that mistake and oh, poor me, you know, whatever. And if I can really just stay present, really present and enjoy the present moment and really connect deeply, you know, then this is where all of the real magic is anyways. And that to me is more of the approach. And so I, I feel like from my medic days and, and, you know, some of the anatomical stuff that I learned that way. And then, you know, it's just from our philosophical studies and our interest, you know, certainly in the yoga sutras and mine in pranayama and harmonies too, and both of us in pranayama. And um, I just, even with all of that, there has to just be 
a simple enjoyment. You just have to come back and enjoy it and just sink really deeply into the present moment and really enjoy that present moment. And then let that come. And this is the real juice. And this is the thing. And out of that, you know, comes that sutra, or not a sutra, that quote from the Bhagavad Gita, the samatvam yoga uchyate, which is yoga is keeping the mind steady. So the more we can come to that present moment, the more we can come just and really sink deeply into what is right now. To me, this is, this is the real starting spot for us. And everything else is... It's an approach, you know, it's great, yeah. they're, they're great things, but we all can get pulled off in our different ways. And to me, it's, it still has the, it's a pragmatic thing. You know, Sankhya is the philosophy, yes, but the yoga is the practice. It's like, come back to practice, come back, come back, come back, come back. I was gonna say, with the winter yeah. approaching, I think that that's the one thing that is really helpful to get you out your door and on the way to your yoga practice is um is make like make that such an enjoyable part of your day that you don't want to miss it you know then you have you, no, yeah, yeah exactly. you, you have love no it problems. Yeah. then you want to get there you yeah. want to do it hot run toddy you know, you know? <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, so joking. if you love it if it's, if someone's so gonna go and do this yeah, you know it's like they're gonna be yeah. like ah <laughs> jeff said drink yeah. yeah i'm like no i didn't yeah. please don't take it that way it's then true. You, it's, it yeah, it needs to be to enjoyable, go. doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. has to be enjoyable. It has yeah. to be something that you love, that you're excited to do every day. That, yeah. you know, even if it's not, you know, even if it's not like, ah, you know, like that excitement when you first started, at least you realize that that the feeling afterwards is going to is gonna get you through the rest of the day or something. Yeah. You have to find the good, you know, you have to find the thing that you love about it yeah. that keeps you coming back. Then it's easy. Then then you, you're going to want to go. You're going to want to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good. I think let's leave everybody with that high and that, that yeah. sense yeah. that, yeah, look yeah. for the enjoyment, look for, Enjoy. yeah, and then the, the middle path. Yeah. One of our teachers said a great path. thing, you know, this idea of um, don't, be ser don't be serious. Yeah. Be sincere yeah. and cultivate sincerity. That's this is like, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff and Harmony, for, right. uh, for talking to me. It's been Thank great. You. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been lovely. lovely. Yeah. Yeah, thanks nice very much. Nice to see you again. <laughs>